اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم فوض امری اللہ ان اللہ بصیر بالعباد ولا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلی العظیم حسبنا اللہ و نعم الوکیل و نعم المولا و نعم النصیر والصلاة والسلام و تحیت و لکرام علی الرسول المسدد المصطفی الامجد المحمود الاحمد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين أضهب الله أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تذكيرا اللهم صلى الله عليه وقل رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم باي ذنب قتل صدق الله العلي العظيم زين مجالسكم بالصلوات على محمد وال محمد اللهم صل على محمد my respected elders brothers and sisters niman salam alaykum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh question what is the role of women within islam keep that question in the back of your mind inshallah we'll return to it Looking at the dimension of our modern world, one of the key elements and one of the key topics and subjects that's at the forefront of our modern world is that of the role of women in society. Indeed, this conversation builds upon the history and the legacy of society with respect to women. Indeed, throughout history, women in a number of sense have been marginalized by societies. Those who sought to seek and marginalize and leverage and use women for political goals, for other power goals, they utilize and marginalize women in many respects. Therefore, when we come to Islam in the modern world, one of the allegations that is put forward towards Islam, one of the things that people come forward and say with respect to Islam, is they say that Islam marginalizes women, Islam is a faith that doesn't give women their due rights, and it's a religion, therefore, that is backwards and is not with modern times. This is the criticism of the critics with respect to Islam. Our analysis of what we want to look at today is, is there truth to this? And what is the reality of this matter? I want to look at a few things with respect to this. I want to look at what is the changing nature and the dynamics of women in society in general, number one. How is our society shifting? And what is the role of women within that modern framework of the modern society at large? Number two, I want to look at what research and what studies throughout history have said with respect to experts and people who have dedicated their lives to Islam and women's studies in particular relating to Islam. What have these individuals said with respect to the role of women in early Islam, in middle Islam, and even in contemporary Islam? What is it that people who are in the forefront and the stage of leadership of Muslim women and leadership in general, what have they said with respect to Islam, its symbols, and its representation? Finally, I want to discuss the pivotal and very important role of women within Islam, shedding particular light on the lady, the great lady, Lady Khadija, the wife of Rasulullah, of the Holy Prophet, and the mother of Fatima al-Zahra. I want to look at her personality and how we can derive jewels that we can implement in our lives so that we can have more beneficial lives and we can commemorate this great lady as well. Having said that, the first point that I would like to come to in modern society is the shifting dynamics and nature of women in society. What do I mean by that? There's no doubt whatsoever that women play an integral and vital role within the modern world and indeed within Islam as well. Women are 50 and 51% of human society as we know it. Women are mothers, women are wives, women are daughters, and they're integral, integral parts of community at large. And this conversation only needs to be had because of the fact that what's happened throughout history is that the role of women has many a times been marginalized, looking at even countries as developed as the United States, where even with only within the last hundred years or so, voting rights have been given to women and things of this nature. And you can imagine this throughout the world. But the allegation that we want to come to in a moment is about Islam and what is Islam's position with respect to women. Is it what has become a sort of a popular narrative in some circles that Islam marginalizes women and doesn't give them the rights? Or is there more to this nuance? But before that, what about modern society? Our modern society is showing that the nature of society is shifting in terms of dynamics. 
in the past, for example, women were not considered economic engines or force for economic benefit. Uh, that means that they weren't earning money according to what society was saying. And so they wouldn't work or perhaps they were homemakers as was seen by that. Another challenge of our modern world in terms of modernization and modernity, one of the main elements of what modernity has given us uh, so, as separated and away from the benefits that it's given us, which I've been talking about numerously throughout the previous days and nights. It's given us numerous benefits in terms of, of income, and it's given us numerous benefits in terms of healthcare, and you name it, and there's many, many others that you and I can think of. At the same time, one of the byproducts and the side effects of modernization and modern societies is to put a value on everything that has to be material in nature. Even though that material value doesn't do justice to the cause, what do I mean? In our modern societies, every person, every individual's life has a value. If you look at the insurance industry, for example, whether you realize it or not, when you and I or an individual goes for life insurance, for example, there's going to be a price that that life insurance company puts on your life. And the price that is put on your life is very different to the price that's put on other people's lives. For example, someone who is a celebrity, someone who is an athlete, someone who's a movie star, someone who is uh, very wealthy and affluent in the business space, for example, that individual or those individuals will have a much higher rate of what they are paid out. That means the value of their life, their net worth, their value of their life will be determined in a certain sense from the economic terms to be very different than someone, for example, who doesn't have those accolades in the material sense. So for example, what does that mean? So I'm somebody who worked hard. I took care of my family. I looked after them. I worked, um, I served my community, but at some level, the economic value that my life has is not equated to somebody else. Why is that? Is that fair? Is that correct? And so one of the byproducts of what's happened in modernization is that women or mothers who are raising children, who are taking care of the house, homemakers, somehow the value of what they were doing for society became bel belittled. It was seen as, as something that was not as valuable. Why? Because it was not seeing, it was not seeming to generate economic prosperity. It was not seeming to generate money and income. And indeed, there's an outlet that publishes every single year, what would be the value of a mother, for example, in society? And indeed, every single year, that number goes up. I know the last number that came forward was if you enumerate all of the things that a mother does from morning to night, looking after the children, looking after the house, looking after all of the different things uh, and, and that, that job requires. And if you were to put a job description out for that, for someone to take that job, what is the salary you would have to pay them? And the number came out to roughly 132000 135000 the last time I saw it. It may be going higher than that right now. The point that I'm driving at is I would argue that that's not even sufficient. How can you put a numeric value? How can you put a, a, a monetary value on the love of a mother, on the affection of a mother, on all the dynamics that, that make uh, someone a mother who serves the family, who takes care and, and does it selflessly? In fact, this idea of doing things altruistically, that is without expecting any return, this was one of the elements that was perplexing Charles Darwin, the founder of, uh, or the one who discovered the theory of evolution, the Darwinian theory of evolution. He said, one thing in my framework of this world that is based on survival of the fittest, that means the, survive, the strongest species, the fittest species survives, uh, he could not reconcile this might is right mentality or this concept or this theory. He couldn't reconcile that with one concept, and that concept was altruism. How is it that people, for example, how is it that parents look after their children without expecting anything in return? How is it possible? He was willing to forego all of that. This whole theory, he was willing to put his theory aside because he couldn't explain this. And yet mothers do this all the time. Women in society do this all the time. And what I want to talk about in our modern society is the dynamics is the value of someone who's a mother, of someone who's a wife, of someone who's a daughter is tremendous, irrespective of monetary value or not. We need to move away from this. This goes back to the worldview. 
the worldview that we may have adopted, whether we realize it or not, is that someone's life value is based upon what they're generating in terms of income. And if you look at even some of the greats throughout history and throughout society, many people who are great, they didn't generate much economic uh, incentives or economic value necessarily. There were people, for example, writers, people who wrote books and texts to help change and shape the world. Now, you may say those ideas led to economic growth. That would be a fair point, perhaps. But at the same time, there's thousands, no, there's millions of people who are helping make the world a better place through their hard work and sincerity every day. And somehow our world may not recognize it. And so we need to be mindful of the worldview that we adopt. In our modern world, women are, for example, going to university and college more than men, according to statistics. They're actually getting educated more. On top of that, they're graduating more than men. So this paradigm that existed before, even in our communities many times, where there was the man and the man got married to the woman and the, man, the husband and wife got married together, and then the husband worked, the wife stayed at home, and usually the man was educated because that required him, uh, he used that to get a job. The woman stayed at home and was not necessarily as educated usually. Well, this whole model is turning on its head. The whole model is shifting. Well, how is this gonna shift our lives? And this is very important to note because the dynamics are not what they used to be, number one. Number two, I want to now come to Islam and its particular specifics. People have argued, many of who are lay people or many in the popular uh, general population in the media have come forward and said, Islam is a religion that marginalizes women, that puts them backwards, that doesn't give them their due rights. Is this true or not? Well, I want to go to experts who have dedicated their lives to studying Islam, to dedicating, dedicating their lives to studying societies and Muslim societies. The example I want to give you is of Professor Ruth Rodad at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. This is someone who's not a Muslim, quite evidently. This is someone who's not even from a Muslim country, who's teaching at a non-Muslim institution, has no bias apparently in this domain. This researcher dedicated a significant amount of time to do what? To look at over 40 bibliographical studies of women in Islam. That is looking at the lives, lives, lives and times and looking at how they lived of early Muslims, middle Muslims and people in Muslim societies in the early days of Islam. And when she went through chapter after chapter, she wanted to see, is there evidence of women being marginalized in, Muslim, in Islamic societies, of women being uh, discriminated against, of women not being taken seriously or any type of marginalization, marginalization. When she went to, and by the way, bibliographical studies are not a chapter or two books. These are volumes, encyclopedia-like documents that can be very, very detailed in nature and take time to analyze and look at. After looking and analyzing these 40 different bibliographical studies, she found that there was no evidence in her research. She found no evidence of marginalization, discrimination, and seclusion of Muslim women in early society. It didn't exist. She said, this is a myth that women have been marginalized. In fact, she argues that women in early Islam were people who were narrating traditions, a hadith as we would call them. They were, they were narrators of tradition. They were people who, for example, had rights in society. They had rights as mothers. They had rights as daughters. They had right, rights as wives, where they were clearly delineated within Islamic teachings, where the chapter of the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, is very clear, there's an entire chapter dedicated to women in Islam. Islam was actually at the forefront in many of these dimensions relating to women, although the much of society was much behind the times, those times that she was looking at. I say this because according to studies such as the research at the University of Hawaii that looked at what is the most clear indicator of someone's religion in modern society. And the researchers found two particular religious identifiers. That is, what is it that someone wears externally that if you see this, you know that they adhere to a particular religion and a particular faith. And according to the research at the University of Hawaii, they found two things stand out more than any other faith uh, on the planet. Things that come to mind are, for example, the yarmulke that the Jewish uh, community wears and the Jewish faith wears, the men there, or other types of, of symbols. They found the two most clear indicators of someone's faith in the world today, number, 
two on the list was the, the turban that is worn by the, our Sikh friends, the people who adhere to the Sikh faith. Number one on the list, the most clear indicator of someone's faith in today's modern society is the hijab that is worn by Muslim women. As soon as someone in society sees a, a lady who's wearing a hijab, whether they're Muslim or not, they recognize this is someone who has, adheres to the Islamic faith. Well, why is this important? This is important to note because our sisters many times are at the forefront of Islam and the modern world. In fact, they are many a times the flag bearers of Islam in the modern world. I say this because many times brothers, such as myself and others, we can blend in in society. We, for example, at the most may have a, a beard, a light beard, a medium beard. We, we may look like someone may come to us and say we're Spanish. We're, for example, we're, we're European or whatever type of different denomination. And at that point, people may be confused about what our faith identity is. It may not be so apparent relative to others. But at the same time, a sister who wears hijab, what, regardless of what her ethnic background is, she is very clearly identified as a Muslim. And many times what follows for, for many of our sisters is undue scrutiny, unfair scrutiny about, well, this hijab, is this something that is marginalizing you in society? Is this something that is taking away your rights? Are you, the buzzword that people love using, are you oppressed? Meaning, is this being opposed on you? Are you being, is your right being stolen away? And at this point, I want to share the words of the very, the very powerful words of the Nobel laureate who addressed this and answered this question perhaps in one of the most beautiful ways, Tawakkul Karman, who won the Nobel Prize, the mother who was very influential in, 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 in the movement to help make the world a better place or try to make the world a, a different place at least. When she was asked, as someone who had won the Nobel Prize, which is seen as something that is the, at the forefront of our modern society, the people who win these prizes are considered to be the leaders of society, the people who are the, the, the symbols of progress in modern society, I should say. And when Tawakkul Karman, when she won the Nobel Prize and had her full hijab as before, as after, they asked her, reporters, journalists came forward and asked her and they said, uh, Ms. Karman, uh, or you have won the Nobel Prize, which is considered one of the greatest honors in society. Yet at the same time, you are wearing this headscarf. Is this not a symbol of oppression? Is this not a symbol of regression? Is this not a symbol of being backwards? Is this not a symbol of being behind the times? And is this not a symbol of you having your rights infringed upon and taken away? She had a beautiful answer. And she said, and what would you and I say at this moment? What would I say at this moment? What would you say at this moment? When someone is challenging your worldview and checking your worldview, do I fold and just say that I will adopt any other worldview blindly? Or will I stop and reflect and say, hey, maybe my, my view has a value and maybe you need to rethink your view. So what did she say at that moment? She said something beautiful. She said that, you know, when mankind first emerged on this planet, when human beings first emerged on society, according to sociology, according to biology, when mankind first emerged, they wore very little clothes. They wore very minimal clothes, if they wore anything at all. And as time progressed, and as the intellect de developed, as the intellect progressed, as the mind developed, as intellect and mindfulness increased, and consciousness increased, and mankind progressed, the amount of clothes that people began to wear, that mankind began to wear, the shirts, the pants, the coverings, as the intellect and mind began to develop more and more, so too did the amount of clothes that people began to wear. She said, therefore, what I am wearing on my head, this headscarf, is not a regressive act. Rather, it is a progressive act. That is, that this symbolizes the height of modern progress and society's progress and the progress of mankind because this is the culmination of covering. And as we've grown in society, we've covered up more. And so my covering up is not backward, it's not regressive, it's rather progressive. In fact, if we went back and I removed the scarf, it would be like going back to the cavemen in the Stone Age time. Imagine, look how she reframed the worldview. Look how she reframed. And it's a fair point across the board. Anyone, 
this idea of imposing, according to sociologists, by the way, if you look at modern society, and this is a deep point, it's a point relating to spirituality, it's a point relating to philosophy, and it's a point relating to, to ethics. Indeed, we should strive for an ethical society. Indeed, we should strive for a philosophically clear society where people are thinking clear. Indeed, we should strive for a spiritual society that tries to make the world a better place by doing good, by following the golden rule. Do unto others as you would like done unto yourself, as Karen Armstrong and many other authors have written, that this is the golden rule of world religions. People who've dedicated their lives have said that this is the common rule to make the world a better place by means of what? Doing unto others as you would like done unto yourself. But is it that there's only one civilization in society? This relates to culture, by the way, as well. Is there only one culture in society? And many people in developing world, in the developing economies, the de developing countries of the world, in Africa, in Asia, and other parts of the world have asked this question and they said, fair enough, we want to develop, we want to modernize, we want to have a culture, we want to have civilization, but hold on a second, we have our own culture, we have our own civilizations, and, you're, and it seems the entire world narrative, the ideas that are building up, are building up towards what? one world culture, one world civilization, which is not inclusive and comprehensive of every other culture civilization. It's actually driving towards one civilization, which according to sociologists is exactly that, a Western Anglo-Saxon, a white Western European American vision of what culture and civilization is. And sociologists have rightly argued that this is not how it should be. What about African civilization and culture? What about Asian civilization and culture? Not only continent-based, but the different countries within it. What about Ugandan civilization and culture? What about Indian civilization and culture? Pakistani civilization and culture? Arab civilization and culture? Are those not civilizations and cultures? Why should the entire narrative be driving towards one culture and civilization, which is dominated by one worldview that is of Western European American view, Anglo-Saxon, the, the, what sociologists have argued is a white worldview. Is this fair to others? Is this fair to others as well? That's something that our world and we as part of the world need to reflect on. Islam had a civilization and a culture as well, similar to African civilization and culture, similar, similar to Jewish civilization and culture, so similar to Christian civilization and culture. Faiths have civilizations and cultures, Regions, countries, nations have civilizations and cultures, and they're good elements, and there may be some questionable elements in all of them. The reason I say this is because what is your worldview? Will I fold under the pressure? Or will I stop and reflect and say, hold on a minute, just because you're imposing a view on me doesn't necessarily make you right. I may have a view as well, and that may be just as valuable as your view, if not more so. Never fall prey to an, to an inferiority complex. It is attributed to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen that two people are doomed. The one who overestimates his ability and the one who underestimates his ability. The one who does not know their self-worth is destined to doom because you will either overestimate what you're able to do or underestimate what you're able to do. To have a philosophically clear view of what your vision, what your purpose is, and what your value is, and by the way, you can always develop your value. All of this is extremely important. Do not let anyone step on your worldview without first having a discussion about it internally and actually understanding what is my real worldview and how does it add value to the world? And is it, is it necessarily that I have to adopt everyone else's worldview just blindly? That's an important point to know. Nonetheless, with respect to Islam in particular, in our view, in particular, as follows Ahlul Bayt Salam, women play a pivotal role and have from the beginning all the way to the middle and all the way to the end with the culmination of Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman. How and so? How so? When we look at the early days of Islam, what was the dynamics before the advent of Rasulullah and the message of Rasulullah? What was happening before Rasulullah's message? It's important to note. There's a moment in time we're told where Rasulullah is sitting with some of his companions. It's attributed to have said that Rasulullah is sitting with some of his companions. And the conversation started about was there a sin or some act that someone did that was before Islam in the era of what is called Ayyam al-Jahiliyyah, the era of ignorance, 
that someone did that was life shaking, that was heart shaking, that was maybe even heart wrenching, that they can't imagine now that Islam has come and life has been reformed, that they could have done something like that back then. You know, Islam, as I mentioned, the works of Ruth Roded, if you even go further than this, in the time of the Ottomans, research showed that in Ottoman Turkish Islamic, the Islamic government there, over 40% of the waqf, the charitable endowments that were established there were established by women and they ran, ran those. This was unheard of at the time in Europe and throughout the world. So Islam has this legacy. I say this because what was happening in pre-Islamic Arabian Jahiliya, uh, Arabia before Islam. Not always, but many a time. So they're gathering. Rasulullah is sitting with his companions and when he's sitting with his companions, the conversation starts, who did something, who, who, who did something that was unfathomable today? One man began to share. He says, Rasulullah, I want to tell you there was something that shook my heart. There was a sin that I did. There was something that I did when I didn't know before Islam that I can't fathom. People began to ask, what is it? He says, well, my tribe and the tribe from what is now modern day Iraq, the, our people from Mecca and Medina, the Hejaz region, we had a war, a battle with the people of what is now called Iraq. When we had this battle, when we had this struggle, the people of Iraq won. When they won this battle, they took our women as hostage. They took our women with them. When they took our women, some of them married our women eventually as well. After many years passed, we eventually signed a peace treaty with them. And when we signed a peace treaty with them, we said that we want our women back. We want our daughters back. We want our children back, uh, who were children at the time and now have gotten older. At that point in time, this man says, Ya Rasulullah, what happened there was, when we had come to this peace agreement and we said that we want our daughters back, we want our women back, at that point in time, the leaders and the chieftains on the other side said of, from the, what is now Iraq, Mesopotamia or the likes, they came forward and said, look, we will give the women and the daughters of yours back on the condition that they first choose what they want to do. Because some of them have married, some of them have started their own families here, they've been living here for years now, and so we'll give them the option. Do you want to go back or do you want to stay? Said very well, and we came to an agreement. When we came to an agreement, this man said that I, my daughter who had gone and been taken prisoner, she had married and started a family there. She chose to not come back. She stayed. When I saw this happen, I became enraged. And I said, if I ever, I made a vow, this man says. The vow was, if ever I have a daughter, what he said, if ever there's a daughter at any moment in time, he says, I will bury that daughter alive. This is what he said. Imagine. And so one daughter after the other would be born and he would bury her alive. Imagine, for those who have daughters, how barbaric this can be. So the companions asked, what else? What else happened after that? What happened next? He said, well, after some time, I was on a business trip and when I returned home, my wife was expecting when I had left. And when I came home, she was no longer expecting. When she was no longer expecting, I stopped and I paused and I asked her, you know that you were expecting, where's our daughter or our son or our child? At that point in time, she said, the wife said that that child was stillborn. The child died in birth or before birth. He said, I became sad, but I, I expected it. I knew this, this is common. I didn't think much of it. As time progressed, we had a, a girl who used to come to our house and she would help my wife clean in the house. She would help my, help my wife with chores around the house. And when she would help my wife with chores around the house, I, as a father, as a fatherly figure, as a paternal kind of love, I felt an affection towards this girl. He says, I remembered she had a very beautiful necklace and I remembered her and she became very close to me. And as time progressed, this girl would come to our house every day and go back and come back and go back. And I asked my wife one day, I said, my wife, my dear, this girl who comes every day, I don't know, but there's something in my heart. I feel a close connection to her. I feel a paternal love to her. I feel like she's almost even like my own daughter. What is it? Who is she? I said, oh, she's the neighbor's daughter. And the neighbor looks after and takes care of her. And she comes to help me around the house. But she said, you feel close to him? I said, yes, I feel close to him, to her. I feel close to her very well. 
as time progressed, this affection grew. When this affection grew, the man tells the Holy Prophet and his companions, as some time moved forward, eventually my wife saw an opportunity. And when this girl had gone home for the day after doing the chores, she came, my wife came to me and said, you remember one time that you mentioned to me that this girl, this daughter of yours is very close, this daughter, who, this, this girl who comes to help is very close to you now. You feel affection towards her. She says, yes, as a father figure, I do. At that point, she said, remember you were on a business trip one day and when you were on a business trip one day and you came back and you were asking about the child and I told you our child was stillborn, it, was, it died in infancy and birth. I said, yes, I remember that. At that point in time, she said, well, you remember that was not really all true. I said, what? He said, well, you remember every single daughter that I had, you buried and you buried alive and you, you killed the daughter. Infanticide, you killed the child in infancy. And I couldn't take you keep doing that. I had a daughter. And I said that I can't have another one buried. So I gave it to the neighbors and had the neighbors raise that daughter. This girl who has the necklace, who comes to the house every single day to help out with the chores, that is your daughter. I didn't know how to tell you. But when you told me that you feel an affection towards this child, I said, I have to tell you. At that point in time, the man became perplexed because he had made a vow and he had given his word. And these were people who, when they kept their word, however irrational, however illogical, however nonsensical that it was, they would follow through on it. And at that point in time, he said, I became perplexed. I became confused. Should I, at this point, follow what I've done, bury the child alive, or should I say that, no, I won't do this anymore? And he thought about this all night. And when he thought about this all night, the next day when the daughter came to the house or the girl came to the house, the man said, come with me. Follow me into the desert. They began to walk. And when they began to walk, the man says to the Rasulullah and his companions, he said, we got to a place in the middle of the desert, far away from anyone else. And I began to dig a ditch and a hole into the ground. I began to shovel sand out of the ground. And when I began to shovel sand out of the ground, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, at some point when the, the hole in the sand became big enough, I took this girl, who was my daughter, and I threw her into the sand. And when I threw her into the sand, at that point in time, I began to throw sand over her and over her and over her. And when I be began to do this, she began to scream out to me and say, Baba, Dad, my father, why do you do this to me? Why do you bury me alive? I am your daughter. I am your daughter. Up until the point that I could no longer hear her scream. The tradition the narration says at this point Rasulullah's eyes became rivers. When they became he began to cry so much because he was someone that was of warm heart. He said that this is the act of a barbaric nation, a hard-hearted, cold nation. And the rahmah, the blessings, the mercy of Allah never descend on a hard-hearted nation. This is what the state was before. This is why the Quran says, the verse that I recited at the beginning, that on that day, on the day of judgment, the infant child, the infant daughter will cry out to God, to Almighty Allah, and say, for which of my sins, what did I do? For which of my sins was I killed? Was I punished with death and buried alive? This is that nature. This is the society that Rasulullah shifted in a 23-year period to make a society where it said that women and daughters in particular are a blessing and a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the beginning of Islam. And the foundation of Islam was laid by Lady Khadija salamullahi alayha, the wife of Rasulullah, the mother of Fatima al-Zahra, who gave everything for Islam. They say that Islam could not have been established were it not for Rasulullah's message, were it not for the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib and in the defense of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and were it not for the wealth of Lady Khadija sallallahu alayha. Lady Khadija came from a very prestigious family, a family that was responsible. There were certain 
councils within Arabia at that time. There were elements of Arabian society that were good. They had, for example, they kept their word and they stuck to it at times. If it was good, that was something that was positive. For example, they were very generous at many times. There were traits that they had that were good. There were certain councils within Arabian society that Lady Khadija's family was a part of and many a times helped to establish, such as there was the food council. There was, for example, councils, for example, for the giving water to people who are visitors, for example. There were different councils, for example, Darun Nadwa, for example. The judiciary, the judiciary council, Lady Khadija's family was responsible for that. And what I want to drive at here is that she was serving even before Islam, but in particular in the culmination of her personality and her being her absolute trust in Rasulullah and her absolute love. You know, some people have made the allegation, Hasha Lillah, some Orientalists that Rasulullah, that this marriage of Lady Khadija and Rasulullah was, God forbid, a marriage of convenience. This is what some have argued. And Karen Armstrong, the writer of various religions, who's written numerous books, History of God and, and the likes, she is someone who's dedicated her life to studying Islam, as well as Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Confucianism, Buddhism. And she looked at the life of Rasulullah in depth. And she said, far from being a marriage of convenience, I am convinced that, that Muhammad loved Khadija deeply and dearly. And why wouldn't he? Because she was the first one to support him in every respect. She's the one who gave not only her property, she gave her life and her being for Rasulullah that she would trust him in every respect, in every dimension, no matter what society said. And it was not easy because society, she was a very prestigious person in society. And despite this prestige, sometimes when you're in a, prestig you're in a prestigious position, a position of honor and dignity in society, and you do something against the grain, and you do something different, you get more scrutiny than others. Because others, people say, you know, it wasn't doing much anyways. But this person has societal prestige. Lady Khadija gave everything. And the women to the point that when Fatima the Zahra, her daughter, was to be born, the women of Quraysh had boycotted her. And they said, we will not help with this birth of this child because you helped the orphan, Muhammad, referring to Rasulullah. She didn't waver. Allah made sure that if the women of Quraysh will boycott, the Meccans will boycott, we will make sure that Fatima the Zahra is buried is, is born through our blessing. How? Allah sent angels and the women of paradise to make sure that this child is born. This is for no coincidence that Lady Khadija is one of the great women of society. Along with Asi, along with Maryam, along with Fatima the Zahra, of course, Khadija, salamu alayha, the four of paradise. She gave everything. And by the way, she's that entity that she's the culmination of Islam. Islam begins with the support of Khadija from the women and it will end and culminate with the support at the end. How? In the mission of Imam Sahib al-Asi was zaman in the mission of Imam Mahdi, the awaited savior, traditions say very clearly that there will be at least 50 women who are supporting the Imam. And if not more than that, there will be up to 700 in some traditions, 800 in some traditions, even more than that at times. And what the scholars say is they will come in phases. But the 313, which are the generals of the Imam's army, at least 50 of those are women. Women play an integral role in the mission of the Imam. Lady Khadija laid that foundation for those women who will be with Imam Saad al-Zaman. The first role model to emulate is Lady Khadija who gave everything in her life. You know, she would spend with her money. Rasulullah would send 50 messengers and ambassadors for tabligh to send the message of Islam to places like Yemen in the south or Egypt in, for example, the west and north and all the way to Sham and Damascus and all the way to the Romans and the Byzantines and throughout. And she would support and fund that up until the point that in the valley, towards the end of her life, in the valley of Abu Talib, Sha'bi Abi Talib, Rasulullah is in a position where Lady Khadija is given everything and she is doing everything to help others, but her life is now on the line. She's eating the leaves of plants. She's eating the bare minimum necessities to survive. Someone may say, 
that she gave her wealth. No, she didn't just give her wealth. She gave everything. To the point that when she's in her final moments, Rasulullah comes forward. And Rasulullah does not have a shroud, according to traditions for her. He does not have a kafan, a shroud to when she is leaving this world and she's left this world and she's died and she's passed away and she's given her life for Islam and the religion. Rasulullah doesn't have a shroud for her. At that point in time, Jibrail, we are told, descends and Jibrail comes forward and says, Ya Rasulullah, O Holy Prophet, Allah has sent a shroud and he sent five shrouds. He says, one is for Khadija, salamullah One is for you, Ya Rasulullah. One is for Ali ibn Abi Talib. One is for Fatima al-Zahra. One is for Al-Hasan, Al-Mujtaba, your grandson. Allah does not will that she does not have a kafir. At that point in time, Rasulullah says, Ya Jibrail, what about my grandson? It is attributed to have been said, what about my grandson, Hussein? At that point in time, Rasulullah says, Rasulullah is told by Jibrail that Allah wills that the struggle and the tragedy of Karbala that Hussein will go through, he will not be given a, a kafan. His kafan will be the dust of Karbala and his ghusl will be his own blood, so to speak. But Lady Khadija, at every moment, she gave everything up until the point it said that she did not even have a shroud. But Lady Khadija, a thousand salams upon you. Come to Karbala, where Hussein ibn Ali is on the ground. Imam Sajjad, the fourth Imam, says that Jabir, do you know what broke my heart? It's attributed for him to have said, Jabir, do you know what broke my heart? He says, what Ibn Rasulullah? He says, on the night of after Karbala, after Ashura, on the night of what is called Gharib sham or sham gharibaan they took and they did the greatest atrocity. What was that greatest atrocity? He says that Jabir, they took the horses and they had the horses trample over the body of my father with their hooves. Jabir, I heard the bones of my father breaking under the hooves of the horses. Jabir, do you know what it's like for a father to hear this and suffer this trauma?